Thank As you. you're pivoting and shifting more to Asia, we had this important summit, the first virtual summit between President Xi and President Biden. It went well. It overran by half an hour. That's the new benchmark of when things go well. Does it make a difference to your strategy? Is it easier when things go well between the U.S. and China? Well, clearly, it's great that the two superpowers of the world are talking. Uh, I think we all acknowledge that there are differences, but differences get resolved through dialogue. And it's great that China and U.S. were talking. And the fact that it overran by 30 minutes is good news. Normally, I get told off when my, my meeting's overrun, but that's that's a positive outcome in this case. Well, you, you probably only get told off if you have to be on Bloomberg TV because we never <laughs> want you late for Bloomberg TV. No, when you look at your pivot to Asia Wealth, how's it going? What's your biggest challenge right now? Is it hiring or is it getting people to sign up? I'm really pleased with the way it's going. Our hiring's ahead of plan. Uh, we're going to recruit an additional 1,000 people into wealth management across Asia. Uh, we're putting over 700 of that into China for our pinnacle investment. We've increased that from an original plan of 550 this year to 700. Um, clearly, it's a competitive market, but we're making great progress. Is it hard because of the quarantine to actually retain talent in Hong Kong? I mean, there's a huge competition. So does it actually make a difference who they hire? Do you have to pay more? We're finding it, that clearly it's a competitive market, but we're doing well in Hong Kong. You know, our business has performed extremely well. Over 65% of the profit of the bank for the first nine months of this year came out of Asia. Um, a lot of that was Hong Kong-based. The business is extremely resilient, but we're able to retain good quality people and we still recruit it. When you look at um, you know, climate change sustainability, what progress has HSBC made? Where are you on fossil fuel? Well, I think the industry as a whole has made a lot of progress on setting out much more detailed plans for the future. I mean, this is a 5, 10, 15-year journey, and it's not going to be resolved in three or six months. But what we are act actively doing at the moment is we're financing our clients. Our green bond performance for the first nine months of this year is double what we did last year. And we're still number one in the green bond market. What we're now doing is embedding sustainability into all aspects of the bank. Asset management, core lending, trade finance. And the most important thing is to help our customers on the journey that they're going to go, go on as they retool their industrial base from old technology, carbon heavy, to new technology, carbon light, or um, carbon neutral. Yeah, well, where's that demand coming from? So you talk from about all biology? sectors. I mean, the transportation sector yeah. is going through a radical change. What about investors? Are, are they mainly US-based or Asia-based? The ones all over. Everyone's all looking at this as a huge opportunity. This is a huge. This is a huge opportunity, not just a challenge. And that's the way I look at it. We said a year ago that we thought over the next 10 years we would be involved in the financing of somewhere between 750 billion and a trillion of financing activity, either on our balance yeah, sheets or in capital mar markets over 10 years. So I view it as an opportunity. The industrial landscape of the world is transforming. Mm -hmm. We're moving from the technologies of the past to the technology of the future. That impacts every sector, power generation, transportation. If I take the airline sector alone, the building of sustainable aviation fuel refineries is a huge investment requirement over the next few years. The first of those plans of scale are now being built, and I want to make sure HSBC is involved in financing that. You know, when you look at the world economy, what worries you at this juncture in time? I know it's inflation. I know you could see some market exuberance actually being tapered off. There's also regulation. How do you look at it? Listen, I'm, I think we can look at the challenges, but let's first look at the positives. The world's economy is recovering. It's recovering well. There are tensions in the supply chain. We shouldn't be too surprised by that. We went into fast reverse. We're now going fast forward. There will be friction in the supply chain for a period of time. But take it as a positive that the world is recovering and economic economies are rebounding. If I then look at the concerns for the future, I am concerned about inflation because I think at the same time as the supply chain recovering, there are some new issues. Supply chains are repositioning, partly because of geopolitics, partly because of resilience considerations by governments. Oil prices are going to remain high for quite a while because there's constrained supply. And the investment cost of new sustainable infrastructure is going to have a premium in the near term. But do you worry about shocks or do you worry about monetary mishap? What does it, you know, what does it mean for a big bank? 
I, I think controlling inflation is going to be a fine art as opposed to a science. Um, and I think we're going to have to make careful judgment calls in the central banks over the next few weeks and months as to how they keep the balance between economic recovery and making sure inflation doesn't get out of control. And I think they'll do that through pulling back on QE and progressive, gradual increases in interest rates. And I think countries will move at different times on that, and that's okay. But it's going to be about balance. Um, we just heard from the former Treasury Secretary, Hank Paulson, also saying it's almost impossible for the U.S. and China to decouple. Yeah. Like, how do you read the Chinese economy right now? And has HSBC rebuilt ties with them? Well, listen, the Chinese economy has been big as a manufacturer of the world for many decades. It's also huge as a consumption market for the future. And I don't think the world can decouple from one of the biggest manufacturing um, nations of the world and what will be one of the biggest consumption markets in the world. So I really hope it doesn't decouple. Will there be differences? You know, differences in views on technology, differences in views on politics? Yes. But I think it's important that there is a level of connectivity between the world and Asia and between the U.S. and China. How many opportunities are you seeing in India? And again, are, are you, do you feel like you're, you're closer to China and Chinese authorities than you were maybe 18 months ago? I feel as though we, we try to be close to all of the authorities that we, we, the countries we operate in. We operate in over 60 countries around the world. We're an international bank. You can't be an international bank and not stay close to regulators and stay close to the markets in which you operate in. So we're close to the Indian um, regulators and the, in, in, in the Indian government the way we are to the Chinese, the way we are to the UK and to the US. Now, our business in India is performing really well. I'm very pleased. Um, We've been steadily increasing the business performance over 10 years. We've got great growth. Uh, we uh, delivered around about 20% growth last year in wholesale banking, and that follows around about 15 to 20% growth for the previous nine years. So I'm really pleased with the way that's going. In general, for your wealth business, do you, do you see, how many bumps along the road do you see? Do you see like a you know a clean trajectory upwards in terms of how you build and for grow? us it's continuous investment. We already start with a very strong platform in Hong Kong. We're one of the biggest wealth managers in Hong Kong. We have on our balance sheet over 1.6 trillion yeah. of assets under management, wealth assets under management for our clients. Whether it's in private banking asset management, yeah. it's in our retail operations. Now, for me, it's about a continuous investment program. I guided the market that we were going to spend six billion yep. over the next three to five years. Three and a half billion of that is building out our wealth business uh, within Asia, and we're going to do that around a, across all of Asia. I think there's wealth opportunities in Hong Kong still, China definitely, Singapore absolutely, and also India. Now, that will be a combination of organic investment, recruiting people, mm -hmm. and as you've seen in Singapore, we bought a business or are in the process of buying a business from AXA, bring that business together with our insurance business, and we have a much more powerful wealth proposition here in Singapore, and I'm looking at three or four other opportunities like that as bolt-on acquisitions over the next few months across Asia. Um, no, have you spoken to Hong Kong authorities so that you don't have to do a quarantine next time you come back as they rolled out the red carpet for... I'm not planning a trip at the moment. On, I, I think it's important for Hong Kong to establish what they need to establish with China on reopening the Hong Kong-China border. I don't want to do anything that may jeopardize that. I would love to get back to Hong Kong as soon as I can, and when the authorities feel it's right for me to back, go back, I will do. I was there at the end of last year. I did two weeks quarantine, and then spent four weeks with clients. It was great, and I'd love to do it again soon.